She's also done ME Psychology. She also has a 13 years of experience in clinical optometry from Jens Chandra Eye Hospital, Chennai. And she is also an independent practitioner at Bubble Vision Eye Care, faculty for Learn Beyond Vision for the course on non-strabismic binocular vision anomalies and pediatric optometry. She is also formerly associated with Ansar University Gurgaon, MIT University Gurgaon, provided clinical training to optometrists at Nirmal Eye Ashram Hospital, Rishikesh and Eye Healthcare Noida. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's post lunch session uh, and I can see all ruby eyes. <laughs> so just to start, uh, the first session uh, post lunch is on understanding amblyopia, that is uh, what we need to look for just beyond visual acuity. Alright, and uh, the learning outcomes that I uh, will have today is one will try and understand amblyopia, next we will learn how to assess a case of amblyopia and finally in the second session we will see the management of amblyopia. Uh, since it's a post lunch session, I'm just doing a quick icebreaker so that people warm up and their attention gets fixed to the session. So for this, I would like all of you to look and read uh, the colors at, as you see it. Read the colors as per the words that you see it. Try doing it. I give you 10 seconds for this. You have done it? Alright, now for the next 10 seconds, read the color and not the words given there. Read it based on color. For example, from the second row, it will be, you will have to read it as blue, green, blue, green, red, green, orange. Now I can see people paying attention. <laughs> you are awake now, right? Okay, so. Uh, which one did you find easier? This is known as a Stroop effect. Alright, which one was easier for you to read the words clearly first or was it to read the uh, colors? Words. So most of us find it easier to read the words because it is automatically in our brains and it is ingrained in us that as soon as you see the word, you need to read up what the word is. But when you add a bit of confusion, then the brain takes up a little time 
for you to actually make the, uh, take the uh, give the answers. So that's why the second one uh, takes a longer time. Now moving on to amblyopia. Okay, there are two cases here: case A and case B. So case A, it is an eight-year-old male with reduced vision in the left eye for the past few years, and uh, the ocular history is that uh, he had history of cataract since birth. The surgery was done at four months of age. Uh, but uh, IOL was not implanted and they had given the FAK glasses but the child hardly wore the glasses. Alright, so this is case A and case B is a 10 year old child with reduced vision in one eye. There was an eye injury that happened at the age of 9 years for which the treatment was done. But post the uh, injury there is some corneal scarring and there is a pupil uh, deformity that is seen. Alright, now in between case A and case B, which of the cases are amblyopic or potentially amblyopic? How many of you say it's case A? How many of you say it's case A and case B? Alright, and how many of you say it is case B, uh, only case B? Okay, good. So there's nobody who says it's only case B. So ideally, it is only case A will be potentially amblyopia. Actually, it will not potentially, it will lead to amblyopia because one, there was cataract. It was present since birth and it was uh, the operation was done at four months of age. So there was form deprivation for up till four months. And after that, there is a huge anisometropia that is developed because the kid was affected. And so this is going to lead to a profound, severe to a profound kind of amblyopia, right? Uh, given the age, you just need to look at the age of the child as well and when the amblyogenic factor which is the cataract has been present. Now in case B, it is a 10 year old male. Up till 8 years, the kid was absolutely fine. There was no uh, any problem with the eyes and uh, uh, the problem or the injury occurred at 9 years of age which means what do we, what do we say as a critical period for development, visual development. Anybody? Seven to eight years or six to eight years is what we call as the extended critical period for development, right? So now, if you see the visual, uh, 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 the visual development for this child has already happened by the time the injury has occurred. So most of the critical period, the person has had a normal visual development, right? So in this second case, there is, it is unlikely to be a case of amblyopia. And the third factor why it is not amblyopia because there, when you are checking his eyes, there is a physical cause that is present. There is a corneal scar which is present, which is potentially leading to a reduction in vision. All right. So number one, the age factor. Number two, there is a physical feature which is present when you examine the eye and that is why this is not a case of amblyopia. Now amblyopia, the definition is something that all of us know. It is dullness of vision. In Greek it is amblyo means dull, opia means vision and this is uh, the definition of amblyopia that we all uh, have read uh, in our books of uh, Dr. Noodle. Alright, so basically when we try and understand this, what it goes on to say is that Whenever there is any kind of abnormal visual development that is happening during the critical period, okay, and for which when you do an eye examination, you are not able to find any cause. And if that, if suppose there is some issue that cause is taken care of and you provide appropriate treatment within the period, then it is reversible. So the vision loss that is happening happens because number one, there is an abnormal visual development that is taking place either in one eye or between the two eyes. Second, that visual, the abnormality or the abnormal visual development happens during the critical period that is initial six months are very crucial and then from six months to eight years. So that eight years period is very crucial so it has to happen during that time. And second, when you do an eye examination, whether it is a fundus examination or a slit lamp examination, you shouldn't find any observable cause, right? And uh, so we all know as we, this is another simplified version if you see, amblyopia is unilateral or a bilateral condition in which the best corrected visual acuity is less than 20-20 in presence of a normal healthy eye. And uh, what I mean normal healthy eye is there are no structural abnormalities 
okay no uh, retinal pathology or no other pathology that you are looking at and the next thing is that it develops during the critical period right so uh, ideally if you say amblyopia can be taken up as a diagnosis of both exclusion and inclusion all right what i mean by this is when it is exclusion we are looking that there is no organic pathology in the eye right there is not, no uh, structural uh, issues or structural abnormalities that you are able to figure out in the eye inclusion uh, there are two factors that need to be uh, remembered here that there should be an amblyogenic factor that is present it can be either an anisometropia it could be a strabismus it could be any media opacity uh, that is leading to uh, form deformation so any of these amblyogenic factors need to be present and second they, these factors need to be present during the critical period which is 6 to 8 years of uh, period now uh, when uh, uh, in a young child we know that the retina is developing the visual pathways are still developing right uh, when the kid is born initially all these pathways are not matured yet they the first 0 to 6 months are very crucial for this development and then then onwards the 6 to 8 years so during the first few months what is most important is that both eyes receive a clear retinal image number one and second that there is no there is no squint that is present during this period because both these factors which is a squint and a refractive error causes a disruption of the visual development or it leads to abnormal visual development and if these two factors are present during the critical period then that is that leads to irreversible reduction in um, visual acuity unless it is treated at appropriate times the same goes for uh, any media opacity as well which is present during that period okay so uh, this was about what is amblyopia and what are the uh, amblyogenic factors which are present which is refractive error strabismus and uh, any media opacities it could be cataract it could be um, a corneal opacity or it could be a hypema any of it which is present but uh, it has to be present during the critical period now when it comes to intensity of amblyopia it all uh, intensity means how severe the amblyopia is it will depend on the age of onset of the uh, amblyopia or the amblyogenic factor and second the kind of amblyogenic factor and the severity of the amblyogenic factor if i give an example a child a two month old child with cataract uh, with a congenital cataract will have a more severe or profound kind of amblyopia than a two months old kid who is having a anisometropia or a high astigmatism related amblyopia if I, another example for that is if there is a three year old with strabismus and a three year old with anisometropia the strabismic amblyopia will be more uh, uh, will cause more severe form of amblyopia again here the age of onset is very important the earlier the onset of the amblyogenic factor or the cause for amblyopia the more severe will be the uh, kind of amblyopia that you see so typically if it if suppose say uh, there is a fact uh, the kid develops anisometropia at say 4 or 5 years of age then that amblyopia the intensity of that amblyopia will be much lesser as opposed to a uh, anisometropia that comes in at say 1 year of age yes. or 6 months of age now there are uh, various risk factors for amblyopia this was again uh, discussed by dr rizwana where some of the risk factors are premature birth low gestational uh, uh, weight for the uh, uh, for the baby or for the growing fetus and uh, ROP, yes, uh, any developmental or neurodevelopmental uh, issues. It could be CP. It could be your. Uh, it could be CP. It could be autism. It could be any of those neurodevelopmental delays, Downs. They have a higher risk of uh, uh, developing amblyopia. You have congenital cataracts, corneal clouding, or any kind of media opacities. You are. Uh, family history of amblyopia is again uh, one of the major risk factors. Wherein you have first degree that is immediate parents or immediate siblings are amblyopic there are certain environmental factors also which put you at risk of developing amblyopia some of the environmental factors are maternal smoking or uh, ingestion of alcohol or taking of drugs during the pregnancy period
So these are some of the risk factors. Now uh, these risk factors doesn't mean that a kid who has had these risk factors should be amblyopic, but then it puts you at a higher risk of developing amblyopia. And there are also kids without these risk factors who develop amblyopia. Now uh, based on visual acuity, uh, this was uh, the classification given by PDIG. Uh, based on the visual acuity, if you want to classify amblyopia, then amblyopia can be classified as mild, moderate and severe. So mild form is somewhere between 6 by 7.5 to 6 by 12. Moderate amblyopia is somewhere between 6.12 to 6.30. And severe amblyopia is between 6 by 30 to 6 by 120. And beyond that, you have the more profound variant. Now, uh, if the diagnostic, if you see the diagnostic criteria, which is uh, given by the AO, this, are, this is in the preferred practice guidelines. Uh, here, they are giving you the guidelines based on a uni how, how you can basically screen for amblyopia based on your unilateral, whether it's unilateral or whether it is uh, how you can go about with a bilateral case. So, if they are very small kids who are having unilateral amblyopia, the response to occlusion, you can typically see when you uh, actually do an eye examination for kids, when very small kids come and you typically try and occlude one eye, right? If the child is showing a strong uh, opposition or a strong, like, no, I don't want to occlude my eye, if that kind of a reaction is coming from the child, it is indicative that the no, other eye, which the eye which you are trying to occlude is the dom better eye or the dominant eye, all right? And the other eye is probably having a reduced visual activity. So this is something asymmetric response to occlusion is something that you need to look for and can be used as a basic screening when you are taking care of very small kids. Now the second is fixation preference. This is especially when you are looking at strabismic cases and you know that the when you try and occlude one eye and ask the uh, uh, squinting eye to fixate, and when you remove the occlusion, typically what happens is there is a the, uh, the eye which was under occlusion takes a fixation. We'll look at it in detail uh, later on. But this I'm just giving you an idea that failure to maintain or initiate a fixation could also be a potential indicator that the eye which is not being occluded probably has a reduction, reduced vision. The other is when there is a difference of two or more lines in visual acuity between the two eyes. So if one eye has a visual acuity of say 6, 6 and the other eye has a visual acuity of 6, 12, then it could be, unless you have done the other examination, this could potentially be a reason or you can say that this could potentially be amblyopia. But again, you will have to rule out the other uh, factors. Now in case of bilateral cases, where in both eyes there is reduced vision, obviously you can't take up the cutoffs as difference between the two eyes. Because both eyes have the same uh, reason and the same reduction in visual acuity. So here you go by age-based visual acuities, which uh, goes on to say that for a 3 to 4 years old child, if the visual acuity is less than 20 by 50, all right, then uh, it could possibly be uh, potentially be amblyogenic in nature and for a, a child who is 4 to 5 years of age a visual acuity of bilateral visual acuity this is the best corrected visual acuity of 20 by 40 could be indicative of amblyopia and for a uh, kid with age uh, uh, greater than 5, 5 or greater than 5 then any visual acuity uh, of uh, less than 20 by 30 or 6 by 9 best corrected visual acuity is potentially amblyogenic in, uh, it could be a potential uh, amblyogenic case, alright. So this is the basic uh, guidelines, alright, and this, uh, you can use this handy as a screener because when you do your refraction and you get these, some, uh, you, if you are able to identify some of these factors, then you could think that probably you need to see in, uh, or do a further checkup for that child or think in terms of amblyopia. Now this is a, a uh, the developmental timelines, this I found in the book uh, by Dr. Leonard Press. The, this timeline is uh, very useful when you are trying to understand the critical period. So the critical period here, what uh, how they have divided is as uh, critical, sensitive, susceptible period and the residual plasticity period. So critical period is from birth till 6 months, wherein there are there is 
at a very high rate, the visual development is taking place. So, at any amblyogenic factor at this point could, could lead to amblyo, uh, amblyopia. And if there is any potentially amblyogenic factor, you need to do aggressive treatment at this point to rectify it. Alright, and the sensitive period, it is from 6 months to, uh, of age to 8 years. Alright, and this is, uh, this is the period again which requires aggressive treatment of amblyopia. Any, if there is any amblyogenic factor, this has to be removed and you have to provide proper correction and do uh, basic amblyopia therapy very aggressively in this period. But they have also mentioned that this is the upper limit for onset of amblyopia. The reason they have mentioned that is eight, by about 8 years, our visual maturation is almost complete. Right? There is still uh, room for more, uh, 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 more changes to happen. There is room for plasticity, but still most of the visual development happens by 8 years of age. So if suppose an anisometropia develops at say 9 years or 10 years, now this potentially will not lead to amblyopia because your visual development has already happened normally. All right? And uh, next is the susceptible period, which is from 8 years to 18 years. At, uh, in this period, again, you need to treat amblyopia uh, aggressively. And during this period, it is uh, much, e it is again easy, you can still treat amblyopia as what we, opposed to what we used to think earlier that beyond 8 years or beyond 10 years, we cannot treat amblyopia. So during this period also you can treat amblyopia, compliance by the patient is essential. But what is important to note here is that if there is any amblyogenic factor that comes into play at this point, it will not lead to amblyopia at this stage. The next is the residual plasticity period which is 18 years and above and in this uh, uh, one thing is uh, uh, amblyopia cannot occur at this point. Second, you can still treat amblyopia. Yes, the response or the improvement levels might be slow but you, you cannot say that it will not happen. This is the exact uh, basis of you will see how we can uh, go about by treating adult amblyopia. So at this point also you can uh, treat a, a patient with amblyopia successfully. What is important here is that the patient is compliant and the patient is motivated enough to follow through for the therapy. Alright, now before I move on to the next slide, this is again, uh, anyone here is amblyopic or having suppression in any one eye? I guess not. Alright, so uh, all of you, most of us have one eye dominant and one eye is non-dominant, right? All of you close your non-dominant uh, dominant eye for 10 seconds. I will show you the picture. You need to spot the difference in the pictures. For the first 10 seconds, you will close your dominant eye. Close, just occlude one eye. Occlude your dominant eye <coughs> in the picture. And try to find all the, the, the differences that are there in the picture. There are multiple differences. Done? I give you a few more seconds. Good. Now, do the same thing by removing the occlusion with both the eyes. Which one was easier? Both eyes. With both eyes. How many found with both eyes it was easier to figure out the spot the differences? I can see some hands up. Alright. So I assume for the rest of them it was better with one eye closed. Okay, how many of you could uh, figure out there are differences in the two pictures? I hope the picture is clear at the back. Okay, there are about six to seven, you can put your hands down. There are about six to seven differences in the entire picture. I will not point out what are the differences, but some of the simple, uh, easiest one to identify is the number of bananas, on the tray there are some things which are missing, which are changed, all right? Yes. Now can I have your uh, focus back here? The idea for showing that picture, the idea for showing this picture is, it, all of us are normals out here, but still with one eye we found it difficult to scan through an image, right, and spot the differences. So you can imagine for a, uh, for a kid or a person with amblyopia who is basically functioning with one eye, how difficult it will be to navigate through a normal scenario and to understand or scan through an environment, right? And that is why we say that 
binocularity is important. So, and another reason why what I wanted to explain here with that is that other deficits, we only look at visual acuity, but there are other deficits also which is associated with amblyopia. Number one is crowding phenomena. I guess most of us know about the crowding phenomena. I'll explain it. Then is the reduced stereopsis, reduced contrast sensitivity. Uh, you have uh, inaccurate fixations. You have poor eye tracking uh, capacities. You have poor accommodative response. And in strabismic amblyo, you will also find spatial distortions, which means they will have difficulty identify, locating where an object is and trying to identify the actual distance between where the object is located or where the uh, uh, where and the distance between for the object is also they have difficulty. So this is uh, a definition which I picked up from Dr. Rizwana's lecture, which is quite apt uh, in this uh, situation wherein you are, uh, you, which gives an idea of the entire picture of what all are the deficits that you see in amblyopia. So amblyopia can also be defined as a visual cacophony of deficits in contrast sensitivity, spatial localization, fixation, ocular motility, accommodation, crowding, attention, motion perception, and temporal processing, right? So when we look at amblyopia, we need to look at all these factors and not just visual acuity. Visual acuity is definitely important, but from when you look at the patient's quality of life or the kind of dif difficulties that the patient will face in day-to-day -day life, all these factors also play a huge role. And many, some of the studies that have been done, they also go on to show that these deficits are not only there in the amblyopic eye, but they also are seen in the dominant eye as well. For example, uh, for an amblyope, an isometropic amblyope, the dominant eye will also have difficulties in contrast, they will have poor contrast sensitivity, and they may also have uh, difficulties when they are doing their uh, tracking movements or when they are doing their uh, uh, fixations. Now, this is a question which is, which of the following three options is potentially amblyogenic? So when I was going through the lecture, I told that there should be an amblyogenic factor that is present for us to uh, uh, in, tell that this vision loss is possibly because of amblyopia, right? Now, as per this, as per the, uh, these three options that are given, the first option is 16 prism diopters of constant alternating isotropia. The second option is 20 prism diopters of constant right isotropia, which is there for both distance and near. The third option is an intermittent exotropia, 12 prism diopters for distance and uh, exophoria for near. Which of the three options is potentially amblyogenic in nature? How many of you say it is A? Good. How many of you say it's B? Right. And how many of you say it is C? Alright. So I guess most of you have got it correctly. It is B, which is 20 prism diopters of constant right isotropia. So this is a case of strabismic uh, amblyopia. This will be a potentially be a case of uh, strabismic amblyopia, wherein. Uh, for you to say that a case is put in, uh, because of strabismus, it's amblyopia because of strabismus, the amblyopia should be constant. The second factor is that amblyopia should be unilateral, right? If it is an alternating, uh, um, uh, alternating squint, then it will not lead to amblyopia because the fixation is getting alternated between either of the eyes, right? And the second, if it is an intermittent uh, squint, if there is even a brief period of time where infusion is there, again that is not going to lead to amblyopia. So mostly if it is a strabismus and you need to classify it as a strabismic amblyope, then the strabismus should be unilateral in nature and it should be constant in nature. The third, it should be present during the critical period. Now this is a second uh, this question which is a five-year-old uh, Kit with a cycloplegic refraction of plus 1.25 with minus 4 diopter cylinder. This is equal in both eyes. Now, what kind of amblyopia is this? How many of you say it is meridional? It's option B. 
How many of you say it's option A? How many of you say it's option C? Alright, so both, you can consider this both as B and C because it's both meridional in nature as well as isometropic in nature. Because you have cylindrical powers and they are equal between the two eyes. So it can be considered as a bilateral case as well as it can be considered as a meridional case. Right, so now we'll just go on to classification of amblyopia based on etiology. So if you look at classification based on etiology, we can see it as traditional refractive, visual deprivation or this has been actually reversed, it is reverse amblyopia caused due to occlusion. So these are the four uh, etiologies uh, and the way you can classify amblyopia based on etiology. Now if it is trebismic, then as I mentioned it has to be unilateral and constant throughout for it to cause amblyopia. If it is refractive, you can further classify them as an isometropic, meridional or bilateral or isometropic amblyopia. Visual deprivation is basically caused when you have any kind of media opacity. It could be cornea, it could be cataract or it could be ptosis or it could also be a, a high femur or blood in the anterior chamber. Uh, the final one is uh, reverse amblyopia which is basically caused by occlusion. So generally as a, a treatment for amblyopia we advise occlusion. But during the initial, the critical period of development, in the initial few years, if you uh, continuously occlude the dominant eye, then there are chances that the dominant eye will go into amblyopia. And this kind of amblyopia is known as your reverse uh, amblyopia. Alright, now let's go and, uh, and have a look at uh, what are the cutoffs for uh, refractive errors to potentially be amblyogenic in nature. So uh, if you look at uh, this again was covered by uh, Dr. Rizwana in this uh, earlier session but I will just go through it again. So if it is uh, isometropic, the refractive errors which are equal in both the eyes, any astigmatism greater than 2.5 could be potentially leading to amblyopia. If it is hyperopia, anything greater than 5 could lead to amblyopia. And if it is myopia, anything greater than 8 diopters could potentially lead to amblyopia. So this, uh, uh, if it is anisometropia, any astigmatism greater than 1.5 diopters could potentially be amblyogenic in nature. Hyperopia, anything greater than 1 diopter and myopia greater than 3 diopters, right? And these are for uh, cutoffs for older kids, uh, by older kids I mean is greater than 5 years of age. We will see the age normative data in some time. Now this is case 1, wherein an 8 year old female, she uh, presents uh, with uh, blurring of vision in one eye. The history of eye exam, there was a history of previous eye examination done and glasses were given, uh, prescribed for her to wear. The prescription given was uh, Plano in one eye 66 and 6 and plus 2.5 diopter in the other eye. Now can you possibly guess what is the kind of situation happening here? What could be possibly the reason for reduced vision? Yeah, it is uh, an isometropic, uh, it could potentially be uh, an isometropic amblyopia. Now based on that, let's go about and see how we can, for this case, how we'll go about doing the assessments. So basically, if you want to categorize uh, uh, assessments, this is one uh, a simple way to categorize. Basic tests that we usually do are history, uh, high contrast, visual, uh, best corrected visual acuity, uh, cyclopragic refraction, keratometry, fundus evaluation. These are the basic tests that have to be done. Uh, so some monocular tests that can be done are fixation test, contrast sensitivity for low uh, contrast visual acuity testing, accommodation testing. Again, in accommodation, you will check both uh, the amplitudes, the facilities, you will uh, have to check and you will also have to check the uh, lag or lead of accommodation. The binocular test that we can do is Bruegger's, the certain sensory test, certain motor test, test for eccentric fixation and the visual efficiency, basically your uh, facilities. Now, I am not going into much detail based on the history, but if you look at history, for a kid, for a small child, uh, when you are looking at the history, you basically need to take a detailed birth history. You need to check the prenatal and perinatal uh, history for the child. 
especially history of uh, when the mother was pregnant, if she had any of these uh, factors present at that period, then you also need to check for any developmental delay that was there in the child. Okay, develop. You need to just have a brief idea of the developmental milestones for the kid. See, uh, check for uh, this again. It will be obvious if the, there is uh, CP or cerebral palsy. If the uh, kid comes with the ocular history, the previous history of treatment for occlusion, then you need to make sure that you inquire in detail about that history. For example, if the child comes to you and then tells that I had uh, undergone a patch test earlier or I had done patching earlier, So uh, here it will be basically on uh, the uh, patching, you will have to inquire about the patching history, the duration, if uh, for how long they had patched and uh, what was the compliance to the therapy because that will determine uh, how compliant, if you suppose you are giving a therapy then how compliant they will be to your therapy, right? And you also need to check for family history of amblyopia. Now let's come at visual acuity. So visual acuity, for, when you test for visual acuity, you always test based on uh, age appropriate charts. So uh, for age appropriate charts, you can use the LIA symbols, you can use HOTV charts. For verbal kids, again, you can use LIA charts, you can, uh, for younger children, you can use HOTV and you can use the LOGMA charts. LOGMA charts are usually better uh, to be used when you are testing visual acuities for uh, uh, any, uh, in general for everybody, especially when you are doing it for amniotes. Uh, this is your high contrast uh, visual acuity, but at the same time, since there is a lot of contrast sensitivity, uh, there are low contrast uh, uh, difficulties that are seen in amniotes, you also need to check for, uh, you also need to check for the contrast sensitivity for these children. Now, uh, coming about, we talked about crowding phenomena. So in crowding, basically what it means is that when we are testing for an amblyo, right, um, we use, uh, if, if we are using a single optotype, then we get a better acuity. So this is typically what we see in kids, when we use single optotype, they give a better response as opposed to when you give a complete line. So this is something you need to keep in mind when you are testing for amblyopia and if you are using a single acuity, uh, single uh, uh, optotype, then what you need to do is you need to use the crowding bars across the optotype so that it can take uh, care of the contour interaction and provide you, it doesn't uh, give you a overestimated answer. Uh, when you are uh, assessing for reading, you need to assess your uh, visual acuity uh, your regular visual acuity, you could also use uh, the 50%, 25% or 12% uh, LIA symbol charts if it's for small children. It's also available in numbers as well. So these charts are uh, useful if you test it because it helps you in assessing the reading efficiency. So many of, because of crowding phenomena, the kids generally have difficulty when they are reading regular textbooks. Right? So when they're reading regular textbooks, they generally have difficulty because the characters are closely spaced and uh, with these kind of charts, you're able to detect those kind of reading difficulties better. Again, refraction, we have done mostly, so I'm not going into the details of it. We need to do objective. Retinoscopy is very important. We, do, uh, we need to do a subjective wherever possible. And during the initial visit for every amblyo, you have to perform a cyclopregic refraction. Uh, we can think this is uh, this to be in terms of uh, this to be amblyopia when there is a difference of two lines. Uh, there is a difference between of two lines between the two eyes. If there is high astigmatism, we need to ensure that we do a keratometry. Alright, just to make sure we uh, we know what the axis is, we know what the K readings are and when we are pre uh, prescribing for high astigmatism, we need to also ensure that the axis of the cylinder is properly prescribed. For high myopes, additionally, if you uh, since we are talking of progressive myopia uh, and myopia control nowadays, so we have to also uh, uh, take care of the axial length measurement 
you do a biometry, make a note of the measurements, so uh, it will be helpful for your future reference. So this is the basic guidelines for correction, which was uh, uh, given, uh, which was also discussed by Dr. Iswana. So I'm not going into detail with, with this, but this, uh, it is always good to have these guidelines with you when you're prescribing for children. Let's move about with how we check for fixations. Uh, so if this is a, uh, if suppose a kid, kid comes and you close one eye, right? If you close one eye and the child, as I said, tries to push your occlusion, then that is indicative that the eye under occlusion is your dominant eye. And uh, so this is one of the screening ways you can uh, check. This is especially useful when you're doing it for strabismic amyloids. This is again, if you look here, <coughs> there is a strabismus or there is isotopia in the right. The moment you occlude the left eye, the right eye takes a fixation and the, when you remove the occlusion, the right eye maintains fixation. So this is indicated that the fixation is, there is no preference for fixation between the two eyes and both the eyes are holding up fixation or uh, probably there is only just a mild fixation preference for the left eye. In the second picture, if you see uh, at the top here, uh, when you place the occluder onto the left eye, the right takes a fixation, but the moment you remove the occluder, the left eye takes back the fixation. So this is indicative of potentially a amblyopia in right eye. Alright, the next important test that you need to look for is the Bruckner's test. Now, in Bruckner's test, when you are uh, looking at the test, uh, when I am uh, assuming that all of you know how this test is done. So, you look for the reflexes and if there is any difference in the red reflex that you get, then that is indicative that the eye which is having a brighter reflex is possibly amblyogenic in, uh, possibly has amblyopia. This again, if you look at the picture below, there is one eye which has a dull reflex and one eye which is having a brighter reflex, right? So this eye is probably having uh, amblyopia because of the deviation. Now this is uh, one case wherein it's a one year old baby. Parents complain of eye turning in for the past six months. Cycloplegic refraction was done. It is plus 2.5 in both eyes. Hirschberg test gives uh, is 30 percent diopters left isotropia. What do you expect when you do a Bruckner's test here? We just discussed that when we see Bruckner's, we generally have an equal reflex between the two eyes. You should get dull equal reflex between the two eyes. So if in any one eye you get a brighter reflex, that would be indicative of some amblyopia in the eye which is having brighter reflex. All right. And we also uh, saw a picture wherein there was a right isotropia and that is uh, that eye when you do Bruckner's you are having a, br a brighter reflex. All right. So the next the case here is of a left isotropia. So which eye would you, uh, what would you see when you look uh, to your Bruckner's reflex test here? Left eye, left eye, right eye. The left eye will have a brighter reflex. So basically if you do a Bruckner's at this for, uh, for this child, you will get a brighter reflex for the left eye. The right will give the normal dull reflex. Now again, we all, I uh, am not going into the details of how we perform these tests. We, we have ocular motility, we need to do ocular motility, we need to do cover test for the ch uh, children because we need, if, if there is tropia, we need to assess what kind of tropia it is, the amount, we need to quantify the tropia, we need to check which eye and the, uh, the quantification of it. Now moving on to sensory testing when we do, we have, uh, we can do works for our test, we can do, uh, we need to do stereopsis. If you suspect the presence of ARC, then we need to do babolinies. We And uh, if again, if uh, 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 you suspect microtropia, uh, you need to, you can do babolinies or your four prism base out test. So, uh, 
again, uh, in a world score dot, basically what we do is when we do the world score dot test, right? When we do the world score dot test, we know uh, what is the normal expected uh, response for a world score dot. If red is in front of the right eye, uh, the patient is having uh, six six and uh, n six in both the eyes, and you are doing a distance world score dot. What is the normal expected response? Four dots. You will get to see four dots. Do you expect the same for near as well? Yes. If a person is six six n six in both the eyes and you do works four dots, so you expect the four dots as a response for distance and near, right? Now, what would be the situation if there is uh, suppression of right eye for distance but uh, fusion at near? What what would be the possible? Uh, Condition here. Three. Okay, uh, so you will either see two, two dots or you will see three dots, right? Uh, typically, a fusion at near and a suppression at distance is indicative of microtopia, right? So, if a patient comes to you uh, with a visual acuity, say 6 12 in one eye, and 6, six, six, six in the other eye, right? these are best corrected visual activities. And you perform a words for dot test. And for distance, you will get a suppression of uh, the eye which is having 6 12 activity. But when you do the uh, uh, words for dot for near, you will generally get a fusion response. The reason because is when we are bringing, doing the uh, words for dot at 40 centimeters, the A, it is. Uh, the, the, uh, the four dots are forming at a larger area on the retina and hence because of that you will not uh, you will get a fusion response and when you get this this is potentially indicative possibly that the child has a microtropia now uh, again uh, if you look at uh, uh, prism four dot test that is also something that we will do when we suspect a case of microtropia now we will also do a stereopsis test, our regular stereopsis test and this is again important when we are uh, looking in terms of a case of amniopia. Now another case is, uh, this is the same case that we just saw, 8 years old uh, female who had blurred vision in one eye, history of eye exam done one month back, was given glasses uh, to wear and these were her prescription. Now, once we completed the testing, what we found out was she had a cycloplegic refraction of plus, uh, plus 5 in the left eye. Uh, her best corrected visual acuity with the glasses, uh, with the best uh, glasses were 66 and 618 partial, right? The uh, words for dot showed a left eye suppression. The CEO acuity was 100 seconds of R. Cover test were an ortho for distance and near. And the rest of the examination was absolutely fine, right? So, what could be the potential diagnosis here? Left eye amblyopia. What is the reason? Anisometropia, right? So, this could this could be a anisometropic amblyopia. Again, uh, uh, if you are suspecting uh, eccentric fixation, you can go ahead and do your visual uh, visuoscopy and uh, fix, uh, check if there is eccentric fixation present. Now in the next case, the reason why that uh, test is important is because uh, uh, this is, uh, the next case is a 12 year old female who failed visual, uh, school vision screening. Her refractions were minus 0 0.25 diopters in the right eye. The left eye was pleno. Cycloplegic refraction was plus one plus one, but uh, uh, on uh, her visual acuities when tested were 612 and 66. The further examination showed that there was no uh, uh, detectable tropia or uh, any kind of folia that was present. But the word score dot showed that there is a right eye suppression at distance and fusion is present at uh, 30 centimeters. Stereo acuity, there was broad stereo acuity present, but she failed the random dot uh, stereogram. Bagolini's test showed that there is a cross with a small central scotoma that is present in the right eye. So what would you uh, think is the possible diagnosis here? Microtropia. So the amblyopia here could potentially be because of a microtropia. <coughs> now when, we, uh, what, when I was saying that when you are looking at amblyopia, there are a lot of uh, 
uh, the amblyopic eye will have a reduction in their accommodative amplitudes and accommodative responses right so uh, they will have a uh, they will have issues with their accommodative facility or they might have an accommodative lag that is present so it is always necessary that when a case of amblyopia comes you also need to check for the amplitudes accommodate monocular accommodative amplitudes you need to assess uh, do your lem retinoscopy to check for the lag or lead of accommodation and you should also assess the monocular accommodative facilities the regular other ocular health examinations to be done so as to rule out any ocular pathology so if uh, this just just to review uh, uh, this was uh, this is a battery of tests that needs to be done when you potentially think that a patient is when you are suspecting this to be a case of amblyopia now do we have any questions Uh, in different cases of amblyopia, uh, right? Uh, when uh, when we uh, in, when we place the neutral density filter, typically when we place a neutral density filter, we see a reduction in vision, right? Reduction in the visual acuity. So uh, when you place it in an amblyopic eye, again you will see a bit of a reduction, but this will be more marked in a case of strabismic amblyopia. Any other questions? Yes, you carry on. Yeah. How often do you find eccentricity in the eyelash See, eccentricity, if, if there is microtropia, then you need to check for eccentric fixation. You also need to check for eccentric fixation when you are looking at higher refractors. Whether it is higher hypropia or higher myopia, in both these cases, you need to check for eccentric fixation. Right? Now, uh, what what we are doing? Uh, uh, let's. Uh, this is a case. Just let me know what's the diagnosis for this case. It's a seven-year-old female with a dry refraction of uh, right eye uh, plano and left eye plus 2.5. Cycloplegic refraction, right eye plus 1.5, left eye plus 2.5. Uh, okay. So this is. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, what is the diagnosis here? This is anisometropia. Right. What is the possible cause of management? Okay. So uh, uh, basically. Uh, um, what the PD guidelines basically say is that for this patient, it is always good to first give the full correction and review after six to eight weeks. So whenever a case of amblyopia comes in, so you do uh, the guidelines suggest that first you do a refractive adaptation first before you start any other treatment modality, whether it is occlusion, whether it is active. Uh, 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 vision therapy, any other modality, you first give a refractive adaptation for and then do a follow up after 6 to 8 weeks. So, we did that for this case. 
wherein it was a six year old male. He had come to my clinic basically. It was just a routine screening that we were doing. The mother of the kid uh, was uh, said that the kid was being very restless and inattentive they, uh, and uh, he often bumped into things and occasionally there was an eye turn that was there and uh, this was seen, the eye turn basically was seen for the past six months after the kid had developed uh, a viral fever. So they checked unaided visual activities, it was 6 by 36 partial in both the eyes and the cyclopelagic refraction both eye was plus 1.5 with minus 4 diopter at 180. There was an alternating uh, exo intermittent exotropia of the uh, parent it was distance equal to near of about 30 prism diopters. And uh, the kid was basically, uh, I had initially sent it for a further referral for a complete uh, evaluation of the retina to rule out any other issues. And then when uh, the, how the kid was managed was that a full prescription for the astigmatism was given which was a plano with minus 4 diopters at 180 and the, uh, even after giving the full prescription the visual acuity was 6 by 24 and 18. Now when we reviewed the case after 12 weeks with glasses there was the visual acuity just with glasses, the visual acuity had improved to 6 by 9 partial in both eyes, 6 by 9 partial and innate in both eyes. The there was a stereopsis of 80 seconds of R. The squint control had also improved considerably just by the use of glasses. And after that, we then worked on the binocularity of the child by improving the binocular. Uh, we worked on the binocularity and tried improving the fusional ranges for this child. Now, um, what I will do is, I will just go about with a basic guideline as how we need to, uh, when, suppose a, a child with amblyopia comes in, how we need to manage a child with uh, amblyopia. <coughs> so, uh, should, uh, if, suppose a child with moderate amblyopia comes in, the first treatment uh, management line would be to just prescribe your uh, uh, prescription and then uh, uh, do a proper uh, evaluation and prescribe whatever cyclopelagic uh, uh, refraction that you are getting it and give time for about 6 to 8 weeks for refractive adaptation. And after that you again uh, see uh, how the amblyopia is, uh, how there is improvement that is happening. You follow up every 6 to 8 weeks until the amblyopia resolves completely. Uh, that which when we mean completely it means there is just one line difference between the two eyes here and or the visual acuity flat use which means there is no, uh, the visual acuity is not improving any further. Now whenever uh, as this is as per the ATS studies the guidelines whenever the visual acuity is not improving beyond the refractive adaptation period then you go about occluding uh, you go about patching that uh, uh, the, ambly, uh, the dominant eye for about two hours, you give two hours of passing, and after that, you follow if, uh, again. Give a uh, you follow that case uh, after for about after about six to eight weeks. The same uh, procedure after six to eight weeks, you check whether the amblyopia is resolving uh, or whether the visual acuity is plateauing. If at this point also visual acuity plateaus. Then you uh, look for increasing the uh, intensity of patching from 2 hours to say 6 hours or you, what you can do is you can try and alternate the treatment. So if you are managing it, uh, co-managing it with an ophthalmologist or uh, in uh, an hospital setup then you can think of atropine, you can switch from occlusion to atropine or you can also think in terms of Bangladesh filter and uh, see how it is working. At this point, you can also look at starting active vision therapy, which could be binocular treatments, which have shown a lot of promise in terms of the improvement of uh, visual acuity. So, uh, uh, this is uh, a review article on uh, management of amblyopia in pediatric patients. So, this gives a brief overview of the entire management, uh, uh, the current management trends that are present. So if you look at the current management trends for amblyopia, uh, we have uh, revital vision which we'll be discussing in uh, uh, some time uh, and then we have binocular therapies 
which is uh, like uh, the, some, one of the binocular therapies wherein you have monocular and MFPF based therapy is your amblyopia INET. You have dicoptic therapies which is uh, binox and the amblyoplate. For uh, binox, uh, we already have the binox team here, so uh, they will explain. Uh, and uh, then you have virtual reality based uh, therapies which is the RIMED. So here you get a VR headset and you it again works on your dicoptic uh, therapy. Now if you look at amblyopia INET, then what happens uh, in amblyopia INET you have both the ocular, uh, monocular option and you have the MFPF option which is the uh, where you are, you can, uh, you are seen with both the eyes but basically using only one eye to do the therapy. And uh, this is again a web based option wherein you are able to give various uh, games to the child. It is very useful in small kids and uh, you are, uh, what the kind of games that are given here is very simple ones which is like letter jump, you follow the target kind, uh, kind of, which are interesting for the small kids and it help, uh, this can, you can also control this uh, software which it can be given in an auto mode or a manual mode. Um, in manual mode you can basically control which therapy is given for how long and you can uh, actually uh, change the duration of the therapies that you provide. Again, uh, there are a lot of studies which go on to say that there is a lot of uh, improvement that is seen with uh, binocular gaming uh, uh, options that are there, which is the dicoptic options that are there. The visual acuity improvement with the bino uh, binocular versions are much better compared to the uh, software options which give monocular therapies. So the basics or uh, benefits of dicoptic therapy would be basically Effective residual, uh, it, it is very effective in residual amblyopias, it is effective in adult amblyopias. You get faster effects, uh, better compliance because these are all video game based uh, 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 options wherein uh, it is more engaging for the children to keep, uh, to keep uh, actually a uh, these are uh, basically uh, the children become more compliant with these therapies because they are uh, game based uh, versions. Okay, now uh, uh, Binox, obviously we have seen a little bit of Binox uh, therapy wherein uh, it is a dicoptic based therapy. Uh, it is given five days per week and uh, this is the module that is given five days per week for six weeks and it gives 30 sessions. I'll just go through this case wherein it is a 15 year old male okay, who had come uh, who had been referred for therapy. Uh, this was a case uh, wherein uh, we have it was an anisometropic amblyopia and we had tried to improve the uh, uh, the kid uh, the, uh, the kid had already taken up therapy somewhere else they had tried the software versions and they didn't want to uh, do the they it didn't improve the visual activity and that is why they tried going ahead with the manual therapy for uh, they came in for the manual therapy so uh, in manual therapy basically we can uh, sequence the therapy as optical correction. This is the first and major thing, uh, major uh, way, in, uh, major phase in amblyopia. Whenever it is a case of amblyopia, the first and foremost is a proper uh, refractive error correction. Followed by that is giving monocular therapy. You occlude one eye and try to uh, give monocular therapy in that eye. Then you have monocular fixation in binocular field, biocular therapy. Binoc uh, binocular therapy and intersensory integration. Alright, so these are the phases in which we need to go about uh, giving a therapy of amblyopia if we are looking at doing manual therapies. I'll just give a break for five minutes and I'll just get back with this.
Now, um, okay, let's look at how we can sequence a binocular uh, event. If you're trying to manage a case of uh, amblyopia and you're trying to give uh, manual therapy, manual uh, visual, th visual therapy for a case of amblyopia, let's see how we can go about doing it. Uh, phase one, we all know optical direction, we need to do it. Occlusion, uh, uh, we know how we need to go about it. I'll just go about how we can improve monocularly, how we can improve the functions. So, uh, monocularly, when we go, we can improve your oculomotor accommodative uh, functions, oculomotor functions, and uh, uh, your perceptual functions. So, uh, basically, also critical age has gone and nothing can be done. But now there are therapies which is FDA approved, it has a science in it and I've been doing it for some time and we have a 24 year old who's joined RV after this. We have done treatment with helping patients with this diagnosis elimination. Even in 37 year old lady who never knew she was amblyopic, we have had two and a half, three lines of improvement and she's still in the treatment process. So I invite Mr. Suman, who's the business head for Revital Vision Therapy. I don't know if all of you have heard of it or not, but it's a new therapy which is actually changed my practice of low vision also. And we need to know when we are talking about adult amblyopia. So next time when you have an adult with amblyopia, there is almost in a short vision improvement that can be done. So what do you think? Can we go ahead? Um, so uh, we all have uh, like 
as a practitioner, we have all have come across uh, different indications in our uh, practice. Coming to amblopia, coming to adult amblopia, and then pathology cases. So, uh, we all would like to give a ray of hope to all those patients who come with the intention that okay, they come to the practice or they come to the doctor or an optometrist with that uh, hope that okay, I could get one solution or one hope of improvement uh, in my condition. So, um, so, and we all also agree that uh, adult amblopia, there is, amblopia is always related to neural plasticity and children are neural plasticity better than adults, but adults are just neural plasticity and we have learned that adults we cannot show any improvement. But that's how the revolution has come and uh, we are with revital vision and then uh, revital vision has a sign strong scientific background and a strong clinical evidence where it has shown significant improvement in adult cases also. So as IK practitioners, we always try to uh, work at the level of uh, OVI and bending lights and then treating at the level of retina. Uh, the visual processing, we all know that happens at the level of brain. So revital vision works at the level of visual cortex by giving specific visual presentations for the upper patch. I'll get into the scientific reasons of why the upper patch and why how it works in our polyps sites and uh, it improves the spatial connections over the period of time and then improves uh, uh, three important parameters. Uh, the, it is 30 to 40 session, vision ther uh, sessions uh, therapy program for two to three months of time where patient performs the entire therapy at the level of food and uh, it it has proven to show very good results in uh, uh, not only in the adult amblyopic cases but also in pathology cases. I talk about the indication once I talk about the signs and the what we can expect from revital vision uh, after the therapy is there is a 90% efficacy rate or a success rate in improving average 2 to 3 log mark line improvement with 100% improvement in contact sensitivity. I, I pause here. Some of you are getting a little distracted. I know it's after lunch and you love to talk. Kindly listen because this is really something new. Some of you may not have heard through it, and we can run through and please try to understand the science behind this. So your attention, please, everybody. Um, anybody would feel to uh, stop if I'm fast or anything? You can stop me in between. Um, so what we can expect is a two and a half log more line improvement with 100% improvement in contrast sensitivity function and 100% improvement in binocularity in two, once the patient completes the revital vision therapy. It is the only FDA cleared vision therapy program or a particle stimulation program for adult amblyopia with a strong clinical evidence of 25 clinical trials to date with 10 peer reviewed journals and currently we have 7 randomized control trials on different category of amblyopic cases with some with secondary amblyopia uh, showing improvement in uh, visual equity contrast and binocularity. Coming to the scientific background of how revital vision has been uh, works is we have four pillars for us which on which the scientific background works on for us. The first uh, pillar is the invention of uh, Gabber patch. It was invented by Dennis Gabber in 1946 with the intention of designing holograms. This is not just a critic presentation, it is a mathematical formula uh, uh, behind this presentation which uh, represents the receptor field size in the visual cortex. And importantly, this was considered to be 25 times more effective in giving cortical stimulation compared to any other stimulus available. The second and most important, and for me it's a fascinating uh, 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 study for me and it would after this presentation, I would feel that you will be fascinated with the study also. Is the uh, in, uh, work on the neural lateral interactions. How uh, the uh, receptor cells interact among themselves to build the connections. So, uh, to, to, to understand this, Hugel and Wiesel in 1959 have done an this CAT trial where they have anesthetized the cat, open cat side with speculum and implant, implanted electrode into cat's brain to measure single cell activity and presented simple light stimulus in front of the cancer <clears throat> and understood that based on the stimulus location, its orientation and its uh, contrast levels, each type of presentation there were a different set of receptor cells that were getting stimulated 
and importantly they were trying to interact with the surrounding cells. So it was the first study to understand the neural lateral interactions at the level of visual cortex and a light ray. So till now we have understood that we have uh, Gaber passage was invented in 1946. We also know that if you present a simple light stimulus, there is an interaction level that is happening. And now what happens when a Gaber patch is given? Yuri Polak, after 30 years of invention of neurolateral interactions, have done the same anesthetic scat trial, but this time with the Gaber patch. And uh, he has presented the Gaber patch into two patterns. One is a sim uh, single Gaber patch presentation. This one. And the second one is using a lateral masking method where the, he has given two more gaper patches on the other side to force the brain to appreciate the central stimulus. And understood that there are the interaction levels were better compared to a light stimulus with a sing single gaper patch. But importantly what happened was when you are creating a neural load by giving the lateral masking method, the interaction levels were three times higher and after certain level of adjustment between the uh, uh, distance between the gaber patches, it went into suppression. The important point to note here is, uh, whenever we look at a treatment modality or a treatment uh, 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 drug uh, modality, we, we wanted to see a bell curve pattern to understand what is the start point of a therapy, treatment modality, what is the peak point and what is the end point. As you can see the uh, blue line on the uh, chart, it shows a, a similar pattern of uh, start, peak and an end point. And the third and important uh, uh, pillar for us is the neural plasticity. We all agree that there is uh, less uh, neural plasticity in adult brains compared to children, but there is a neural plasticity in adult brains also. There are some references where uh, the uh, amblyopic eye suddenly wakes up when your uh, good eye vision is lost due to cataract or ARM. So there are some uh, references and also practically in our real life we know that uh, most of our uh, uh, parents never used a smartphone and suddenly when it came into the uh, market and people started using it and eventually they got adapted to it. So, and neural plasticity relates to the ability of the brain to process any new information and use it. So, that is one of the simple evidences what we have that there is a uh, plasticity but if it is trained well, used well, it definitely shows an outcome. And the last and important topic for us is the perception learning. Perception learning is a method where you repetitively do the same task every day, but every day you do it, but eventually every day the threshold levels are increasing. For example, you do a, uh, you learn a, a bicycle riding where you systematically learn the program, a cycle riding by under the pedal, then over the pedal, then on the seat. But eventually you learn to drive the right bicycle by sitting on the seat. But when you do the same task after 10 years or 15 years of time, you, you start doing your best threshold. You don't go back to your basic threshold of before starting a learning what to do. So that is the concept of perceptual learning, which is there in our day-to-day -day life activities every day. We do it in a programmed way of learning. So any activity learned in a programmed way of a method which systematically increasing the threshold levels has proven to show better outcomes compared to jumping into thresholds. So, <clears throat> in summary, revital vision uses, uh, uh, works on a scientific lines of perception learning where it systematically trains the brain to build the neural lateral interaction levels. By giving specific visual task, which repetitively, uh, it's kind of the same presentation, but the patient feels it's the same presentation, but it is going into threshold levels, which is making it difficult. Which promotes spatial interactions at the level of visual cortex, which in turn will improve the connections at the level of visual cortex, improve the signal strength, reduce the noise levels, which in turn will improve the primary visual function, what we call it as a contrasensitivity, And then improve visual acuity and binocular. As, as an eye care practitioner, we all have to agree with this fact that contrast sensitivity function is the primary visual function which is required, which has to be analyzed and which has to be used. But unfortunately, in the clinical practice, we do not know how to quantify it and where to use it, if we quantify it also. 
So that's the reason we take visual acuity as a primary outcome. And then contrast sensitivity somewhere we try to measure it with Peller option chart. But unfortunately, Peller option chart gives us a contrast sensitivity function measurement only for basic contrast levels, one threshold level and then variable clarity levels. But we need contrast for different spatial frequency range from low contrast to high contrast, big images to fine resolution images. So we need a contrast sensitivity spectrum to measure. So that's where we call it as contrast sensitivity function and contrast sensitivity importance. So how does revital vision does that? How does uh, it improve? And how does it know that uh, how to give each uh, specific presentation to each and every patient? So the first two three sessions are called baseline, where it randomly gives presentation to patient and takes responses, and that's when it determines the baseline threshold of uh, each and every patient. And then it gives different type of presentations based on, and it identifies the cortical deficit areas. Then it customizes the presentation for each and every patient, where it randomly gives different size, orientation, contrast, <coughs> global orientation, uh, flanker separation. So it gives a combination of presentations which would build the neural connections specific to the patient need and then improve the important visual functions, primary visual functions, the uh, two and a half normal line improvement with 100% improvement in contrast sensitivity function and 100% improvement in binocular. So given that we understand the scientific background of um, and um, of revital vision and how it works, uh, I started uh, working with the revital vision two years back and uh, I, I was, my first case was Carbis with 19 years, 19 years old girl. And I did not start promoting uh, revital vision till I see the result in the first, the first patient. And I went to her house every day to do the sessions at home. She's a poor girl. I used to go there, do the sessions, and once I see the result in 30 days, that's when I realized it is working. In the same fashion, we started uh, working on adult amblopia and we have been seeing very good outcomes in adult amblopia. Additionally, we started exploring the pathology cases where we have seen uh, uh, outcomes in uh, post-PK cases, which is our uh, published randomized control trial from China in 2022, where uh, I'll go through the studies in the following slides, and we have uh, uh, a prospect current, this is a trial on star guards, but we have currently doing a prospect trial with SN Chennai on the star guards also, where we are, we are currently seeing a, pro a promising results with improved contrast sensitivity function and binocular clarity. We have a very good outcome on congenital nystagmus where we have done a randomized control trial in Israel and currently in APOS this month in, on 8th we are presenting a follow-up data for 6 months on congenital nystagmus. And uh, we have other indications what we have explored is uh, coloboma cases we have done, we have done some degenerative cases, uh, written degenerations. Then we have done, we have done one uh, randomized control trial on post C3 uh, keratoconus cases, not improving to 66, where we have seen a significant improvement in visual equity, contrast sensitivity, and binocularity in all uh, three para primary visual functions. Um, this is the first trial which was uh, published in 2004 and it was submitted for FDS uh, approval, where uh, control group was given a simple. Uh, GABA patch presentation without the algorithm of revital vision and the treatment group was of 44 patients were given uh, uh, revital vision where the average age in both the groups was around 38 and 35. The treatment group have shown a significant 2.1 line improvement in visual equity with improved contrast sensitivity function and all the spe spectral frequency range. <clears throat> As you can see the red line, this is the contrast sensitivity function measurement before the therapy and the blue line is immediately after the therapy of 40 sessions which is for 3 months and importantly these patients are monitored in 12 months without the uh, just to understand vision retainability or the regression uh, part of the vision and surprisingly we have seen no uh, we have seen a half a line regression in vision which was not statistically significant but importantly 
the visual acuity, the contrast sensitivity function improved on its own. There was no intervention given after the therapy. The, the simple uh, scientific example uh, reasoning what we give is the brain has learned to use both eyes more uh, efficiently than before the therapy. That's when the contrast sensitivity function improved on its own. And um, a significant improvement in binocularity uh, in all category of amblyopia and all age groups. With significant 70% of uh, steady population improving binocularity, uh, stereotypic improvement and moving from suppression to fusion. This is another ASICRI trial which was uh, published in uh, 2014 uh, where uh, control group was given uh, simple uh, video game presentations. This is not a deck optic presentation uh, but just a, a simple video game presentation with full optical correction. And the treatment group was given optical correction with revital vision. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the average improvement uh, was uh, close to 2.6 line log non line improvement with improved contrast sensitivity function. And these patients were monitored till one year ago. This is a very recent trial from uh, China on uh, secondary amblyopia TSS uh, post PK uh, keratoplasty uh, post, uh, post cases, uh, post limbal nerve excision in children between 9 to 14 years of age. Uh, and the control group was given uh, patching plus full optical correction, if it is there anything. And the treatment group was given patching plus rewrite and vision. And uh, the treatment group have shown a close to 0.3 of line improvement in vision. And then there was also a significant contrast sensitivity function improvement. Important point to note here is, yes, there is a small sample size, but yes, it is a stimulus deprived case which is said to be more adamant to change whatever you do. So it has shown a significant improvement in those cases. And this is uh, data from Indian eyes uh, where uh, 45 patients were selected uh, uh, where after giving uh, 6 months of patching all these patients were given rebate vision after the patching. Whatever improvement they have achieved through patching beyond that point they have improved close to 2 log line improvement. Importantly, very, uh, uh, in the recent AIOC conference, this data of, of, of 5 years observation data of these patients was presented in the AIOC conference with uh, not uh, no statistical uh, significant regression in vision. And these are some uh, secondary amblyopia cases which I just want to uh, quickly uh, have a view on where algorithm and uh, bilateral amblyopic cases. Um, where uh, the average improvement, what we have seen in the treatment group is too long a line improvement. Unfortunately, I do not have the recent study data because it's still under pro uh, presentations. Uh, so, and it was a sudden call for me to do a presentation, so I did not prepare the slides for that. But I can definitely uh, send all the clinical material to every member available. Yeah, thank you, Suman. In fact, this was more important because what was heard in the discussion is ki how is adult and myopia being treated and what are we talking about these cases in low vision also. So it's all making you understand the principle behind this. We are working at the brain level now. We are bypassing the retina and other things. If you could, if you, do you have a small demo of how the patch is? Yeah, yeah so this therapy is home based, number one. Patient would do it at home in a dark room. And they have to see the garbage patch which we are talking, they have to look at the computer screen with this patches which is there. So we have the binox which we are talking about kids because that's more gameplay and it's more interesting and we don't have to do occlusion which we just taught you all. But this is again talking about low vision and adult and myopia. So maybe something new for all of you to understand but next time if you have a low vision or a patient who can be, you can actually think about these kind of treatments with it. I think you'll need Wi-Fi or internet to run that? Uh, correct. Yeah. So it's just to show you how that is. And if you have to have Binox therapy, we would have the Binox team also. You can see what goes in. So we'll just show you a quick, very quick one or two steps of demo. What is the patient seeing like, right? When they do this therapy. So we have training so, sessions at home and, and this is our yeah. Yeah. Uh, therapy is based on these four presentations. Uh, so as I said, it gives a different size, orientation, contrast. 
So the combination is decided by the algorithm and uh, uh, the algorithm decides based on the cortical deficit areas what angular presentation has to be, what contrast, what size. So it is decided between these four presentations. And it's a combination what that patient does. So first one is for single image task where patient sees a circle and press the center button on the mouse. Once they press the center button, you get two blinks on the screen. So and as you can see, there was an image in the one blink, uh, whether it is left or right. Uh, sorry, I'll come again. I was distracted. Sorry. So as you can see, there's a circle. Press the center button on the screen. You have two blinks. As you can see, the image is there in the second blink. Identify the uh, image if that is in the first blink or second blink. If it is there in the first blink, answer is left button on the mouse. If it is there in the second blink, it is right button on the mouse. Because it was in the second, I press the right, right button. The same again, it goes again. So as and when the patient gives the correct answer, it goes down in three quarters. It's a staircase model. It becomes difficult for a patient to see. And there will be a point where patient have to make a guess because they can, he, he or she cannot see the presentation. They have to make a guess. It can be right or wrong. If it is wrong, it makes it easy. It's just a staircase model, but the algorithm decides when to stop the sessions. Yeah. So this is this is available. You can even see if the demos on the website and all. And uh, I think we can have uh, someone who is also been doing from Shaw Hospital is the optometrist, Dr. Sumaganesh could not make it because it's another conference just right there. Who would just like to share his experience on this? Sensory status was uh, OS was left by was suppression with absence of stereotis. Uh, then she was operated, basically he, had a, he was having suppression, so he was operated. After operation, his vision was still 636. He was having the motor, sense, motor status was, he was having just bilateral DVD. And the sensory status was, he was still suppression with left eye and there was still absence of stereotis. So he, was, he has been advised for 8 hours of patching. But though after 8 hours of patching, after uh, 2 months, he was still having 636 in the left eye. And his uh, stereotype was still absent. So we have planned for revital. So we have planned for revital gen therapy. After 80 sessions of revital gen therapy, uh, the left eye vision increased to 618 and the stereotype increased to 800 seconds of R. And after that, uh, all the sessions were finished and we have planned for anti submission exercises for them. So when we compare about the uh, contrast of the patients, uh, pre-contrast, uh, we can see the left one was 1, 1, 1, and 1 in the right hand side of mind. And it increased to uh, 4, 4, 4, 3. It's a long unit basically. Uh, we use it for checking the contrast and sensitivity of the patient. And the second case uh, is a case of anisometric amblyopia. It's a 13 year old child with a uh, severe of uh, minus 8, which we got. And it has a visual of 636 in the left side. And after patching, uh, her vision was still 636. And then we have planned for the vision. And after 40 sessions, her left eye vision improved to 618. 
and the stereo also improved to 147 hz r after eighty sessions the vision improved to 6 to 12 and the stereo improved to 100 seconds of power. Support rate uh, over here. Though in special for the MC 6 to 12 uh, vision we have added more 20 sessions after finishing the 80 sessions of power. And this is the contrast table which we can see uh, in the right side. Uh, it's 2111 in the pre uh, starting of the sessions and it is 25433 which is an Good uh, contrast sensitivity for the patient, and she could uh, even was so happy. Her functional vision was also good. So these are the two cases which I presented for the revival. Thank you. Come on. I would like to hand over the mic to uh, Roshni. Uh, Hi, Roshni. Thank you so much. Now I would like to call Professor Monika Chaudhary Ma'am to kindly felicitate our guest, uh, Ms. Kulwant uh, Kaur, who is an orthoptist at Ames Hospital, Delhi. Give a round of applause. The introduction is, we senior people like this, she has been our teacher. Thank you so much. And she has been Now we would like to call uh, Dr. Ajit Bhagwan sir, who is a director at Optic and also director of CRT Bionics India, to please come on the stage and share a few words on the visual therapy clinics. <laughs> Give a round of applause. So, in fact, some of you know that this post as more of a tennis player, and of course, uh, what I would introduce about him is he's always a time ahead. He's Given his vision, many times what we have even not thought about is going to happen. If you are going to talk, we people started hearing about telemedicine much later before he started practicing also. And today he said that I want to put in a comment or a statement of some vision for which we invite him to say, where are we in biocular vision in our practices? Well, thank you Monica for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you. You know, I graduated in 1979, I think it's 45 years back. My, most of you were not born then. See, practice of optometry has changed in such a way that we grew upon not the retinoscope, but we used to have spot retinoscope. I don't think any of you have seen that. And now when uh, I came into private practice, I hire optometrist and I give them a sleek retinoscope. And most of them have difficulty because they have used on, uh, you know, where we only use your uh, computers now, we used uh, for any testing. And all of our optometrists where we hire, they want an instrument which can, uh, which is, which can self-align, auto-focus, auto-adjust, what they have to do sometimes even auto-click and this is what the instruments they want and they tell me that's the way that optometry is today so you learned the hard way because that was the time the technology was not there and recently I have uh, I got an opportunity to visit uh, US and one uh, city in Canada where I was very I'm attracted to two clinics which optometrists have started one was named as uh, Computer Vision Clinic. And in the same city I saw digital eye clinics. So, I saw it was owned by an optometrist, so I decided to meet him. I said, what exactly do you do? And uh, 
I, he was kind enough, I introduced myself, I said I'm not metrics practicing in India and this is uh, my job and I've been in the international optometry so he was kind enough that he took around his clinic. See the revolution what has come in optical whereby now we got a opportunity to move to selling myopia control lenses. The same technology is coming, is coming into orthoptics or something coming into vision therapy. And they use an instrument called N3. I like you to Google that instrument. It's a small instrument, which is visual, you know, based on VR technology, whereby you just put on the patient's head and it tells you exactly how much chorea, how much convergence insufficiency, whether your patient has steroxis difficulty. It gives you 12 parameters and exactly calculates how many diopters of prism you need to incorporate in the spectacle lenses. And all the spectacle lenses dispense from all digital clinics. You know the amount of uh, uh, work we do on computers, amount of patient, number of patients which are, number of children who are using computers or even laptop or you know tablets for 8 to 10 hours a day. All of them are having this difficulty of headaches, pain, eye ache, back ache, you know, everywhere. So all these patients are given those special lenses which are called neuro lenses. And these are special lenses in which the prism is already, you know, countered into it. Prism is already incorporated and totally based on the result which is based on the come out of this instrument. So these lenses, if you even you go to check, I wanted to check whether they are available in India. But on Google there is a page which says neuro lenses for India. But there is no detail available on that. So there is going to be soon lenses for patients who have, you know, vision therapy problems, who have exophoria, who have esophoria, and you or patients having work, uh, difficulty in working on computers or headaches. So and there are number of optometrists who are gaining employment or who are practicing only neuro lenses in US. Go to their site and see. Did you ask, you know, whether you want to look for a provider or you want to look for a lens or whether you are a patient or whether you are an optometrist who want to practice that. So this is one thing I want to tell you about. One is the neuro lens. Second area or second clinic I visited that was in again in the US. This was only focused on vision therapy. As I mentioned, today's optometrists, they want instant results. They don't want to put their mind into all the, you know, what we are learning. Obviously, we learn and we forget the next day. So this is an instrument called eye kinetics. Note it down. It's a basic instrument, which is just as, a, as small as a bibliometer. And what it does, it has two infrared cameras. It projects a stimulus in one eye and it records the response of that stimulus in both eyes and diagnoses whether the patient has uh, amblyopia or patient has glaucoma or patient has optic neuritis or patient has tumors within 30 seconds. All these tests are objective and uh, I would suggest and I would uh, like you to do it on these two instruments, eye kinetics by Vision technology, this is the Conan is the company. And uh, what it does is this, that the, the two cameras, they record the response of the two pupils and give a comparative assessment how the retina has perceived the images and gives you a score which is based on RAPD response. I'm sure that swinging that flies that we have been teaching to the student, but not many of them are confident of doing it. And we have to keep on teaching them and we keep on forgetting it all the time. So this gives you a percentage of RNPD difference between the two eyes. And you don't need to worry about, you, give, you don't need even your, I mean, optometrist to do it. Even your technicians in the clinic can just ask, you just ask the patient to sit, put the eyes on this instrument, called, and the technology is called bibliography, whereby you diagnose all the diseases, all the primary diseases within 30 seconds. At the same time, whatever the therapy you have employed, whether it is patching or whether it is uh, your uh, uh, VR-based technology like Revital or all this, after doing the therapy, you can again measure this, whether the percentage has gone up or have become equal or not. So there's nothing subjective in it. It's all objective and it's done in all the pediatric children's 
and even in adults where you have uh, uh, vision loss because of neurological uh, disorders. So that's my small uh, two um, technologies which I feel that optometrists should know. I try to get those technologies if it is uh, try to learn to them and try to know about it that these exist and uh, all this. Again, if you do notice there is a development happening in Israel who are make, making the single instruments which is called eye shift, which again measures all your parameters, all your vision therapy diagnostics within 30 to 40 seconds, again objectively. You don't need any calculations, you don't need any instrument, read about it. And Essilor has uh, got the selling rights for that company from them and they want to promote it with the lenses they want to be selling in India in the time to come, incorporating prisms in it and that's going to be a future for vision therapy, the selling lenses with the prisms which the patient needs, which is ideally and totally made for that particular patient. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. These insights, the new things, and every time he talks, these are like new names to us, but very soon you would come across. Not you, but your patients will start asking you. Aapne ye naam suna hai. Ye product milta hai. Aapke paas hai. Aap bata sakte ho ke paas hai. So the time is changing, and I certainly like to add that vision therapy and binocular vision is now 50% at least of your clinical practice, whatever speciality you are doing. You'll have to go into it, and if you do not add therapies into it, you'll never have happy patients. Patients are going to the optical counters and getting glasses made, but they come back to you because there is something extra that you are doing. And for all those faculties who are here also, the message was, that there is so much which is evolving in this, what have we have heard. Once one instrument and everything detected also is coming up. I think optometry has very good future in it. Referral, co-management, and you are the detectors. You know, uh, in our times you only had Seleptophore. Yeah. And the problem with Seleptophore <laughs> is this, that optometry don't want to spend 15 minutes standing there. And it doesn't make even sense for me that I should make my optometry stand for 15 minutes. I bought two, three retinoscopes and both of them I could not even recover the investment in it. To be frank, I'm telling you. But now the technology is software based, whereby you pay only for the software if you take it. So that makes a lot of sense from a uh, business point of view. Where, whereby everything is changing to home based, everything is based, changing to like you just only what you need to do either give them red and green glasses or you tell them, okay, fine, this doesn't require even the red and green glasses. Patients can do it at home. home. At the same time, have those instruments in the clinic whereby you can authenticate, yes, this was the, your score, this is called RAPD score, I'm sure everybody knows, you can read about it, uh, uh, the instrument I have told you, eye kinetics or RAPD score and uh, this, uh, the second is the NeuroLens, go to NeuroLens website, you will see the instrument, you see how to do it and how, how, how it is being sold all over the US and Canada. In fact, I would add here, whatever in the morning we have this clinical assessment. One misconception we should not have that there is a software, there is a patient detected and we just refer. The software does the treatment and management but the clinical evaluation and follow up is yours. We have seen therapy is not working just because you did not pick up the right case. When we had even the, in the morning half of us could not diagnose. Just the conversion of insufficiency is linked with so many things. We just cannot give therapy without it. So your clinical assessment and evaluation post the management, the software is doing the job, beautiful thing, because it is doing home-based therapy. And patients enjoy those computer games or even these patches which are stimulating. So, but very importantly, home-based therapies, manual therapies, there is, they, they are added along with it. So software and the manual therapies combinations have to be done, clinical evaluation has to be done. So I think, uh, thank you so much for your insights. I would like you to... Really I have one question. Ma'am, I have one question. Yes. Okay, yes. If I can have the mic. Yeah, please. Thanks for the... Uh, uh, thanks for the inputs on those three new devices. Uh, two things for an optum. Uh, one, this is a question for you and all of us. Why are these devices not available in India? 
that we don't create a demand because we are not exploring that those options or we are so uh, or we are not hum log clinically we are not clinically strong to get those devices in no no the see, see the thing is is that any company who makes anything they want to test that product in the market where there is a bigger market i'm sure you did the same with the vital your product too you come to india when you feel the product is successful it can it needs uh, i mean it's successful in sense because most of the products you you sell or almost all the products you sell in us has to be fda approved so uh, without a pool you cannot work but what i feel is see myopia control lens has been packaged in us 10 years back only came to india about 2 years back so it is just a question of time that's what i'm telling you is the future that you will be say, uh, selling lenses which are having neuro lenses or lenses with which have prisms it's just the time i think presence yeah. is becoming part of the ethics is because of our work i mean the type of yeah. you know how much time you spend on your how much your eyes are converging all the time on the computer you know i mean you are putting so much of pressure on your thigh of your love of the time and uh, this is what is happening with these are things all the syndromes that you call the computer vision syndrome or digital syndromes and uh, i think it is just a question of time that they will launch it in india very soon i i told you i checked out the website and they have a chapter for india uh, and you will ask for it i know uh, the one of my junior is that uh, so i am aware of the fact but uh, i just want to uh, give the prospect to all the upcoming optometrist that when it says learn beyond vision you learn beyond just assessing the vision you need to start assessing beyond the vision and make sure that those companies run behind us for coming to india because these are some innovative beautiful products and there's something else called syntonics also which has introduced one recent device with photo uh, 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 what it, it is a photo uh, synthesizer where uh, it works on uh, neurological defect of visual field defects Where neurological disorders. I mean, you know, with this law coming in, optometry being a primary eye care profession, it has become more. It has put more of a responsibility on optometrists, so that you don't do not uh, miss out, and uh, you are not just only the eye care provider, but you are health care provider. You should be able to understand the patient and diagnose patients. What the optometrists do in US, they diagnose more patients with hypertension and diabetic retinopathy and uh, other diseases than the physicians in US. And that is what I am just suggesting that the optometrist should invent in the or uh, invest in instruments which are ideal for family eye eye care practice. And eye diagnostics is one of the I have instrument which is I'm sure it, it cannot be expensive because it is called pupillometer or the object pupillometer is called in US, so it can't be that expensive too. So I think it is uh, responsibility that uh, that is put on us, and we need to see that we are able to meet up that expectation of patients and the public and. <coughs> for joining us we still have something more left but uh, in the interest of time couple of our sponsors they are have to travel back they have a flight to catch so we would like to invite mr oli from binox um, to receive a small token of appreciation from team mcbi and lbb all <laughs>
The day has not ended. We have not said bye to everybody because we have Gayatri yet to cover up that part of demonstration. Now you were seeing some equipments lying outside. Some of you may be knowing it, but some of you may not be knowing it. So she is going to come here and say rather than running videos, let's actually see stereopsis measure kaise karte hai, what are the various vision therapies, the manual vision therapies. Again, agree to the fact softwares are there, but there is no comparison to the manual therapy. If you don't do manual therapy or add it, your treatments are not complete. Gayatri, the stage is yours. And we would say that the products she's going to use are the good life products. Okay, sorry, until Gayatri sets in, Arunesh, you would like to come? Aishwarya? Okay, you wanted to call me. Suman, since you have acknowledged, and I would say, I have done a lot of revital care and I am very happy with you. In fact, I do all my kids' binox. These train I do binox for all this. We do all my low vision. Practice has changed after revital came. And we do a lot of adult and myopia. Suman, on, uh, from Shroff Hospital is here. Please come. You would like to felicitate you also. Demonstrate you. Please learn how to do these examination, visual examination procedures and this. So, Gayatri, which one are you starting first? Can we have mic for her? Uh, uh, yeah. Roshni? How many of you know what it is? Which one is this? Uh, are you all able to hear my voice? Yeah, but we'll add the mic. We'll add the mic. Um, so this is the Leah chart. It is the ten. Uh, so basically, this is for using at ten feet, right? And we all know Leah has four symbols. So one is a circle, one is a house, one is a square, and one is heart, or you can call it Aapu. All right. So what happens is many a times when we show these symbols to children, children. Uh, you can use them for uh, younger kids as well. So some, many of the ch children, sometimes they don't know the symbols yet. Right? So it's always good when you start, you always make them point to the symbols and familiarize them with the symbols first before you are actually assessing the visual acuity. Spend that five minutes trying to talk or building a rapport with the child when you're initially doing an assessment. And you also spend some time trying to understand what is what are they seeing in these symbols or how are they comparing the symbols from the symbols that they are seeing here. Alright? And then you open up one eye and if somebody wants to come here as a small kid and answer <coughs> So we have to one of one of you can come, I'll call the other person so that ask some other One thing I will say that this should be part of every other person. Rakshit. Rakshit. I am second year B optometry student from Delhi School. Okay. So we have Rakshit who is a second year student. Alright. So now Rakshit will pretend to be a four year old kid and respond to the Lia symbols where we are having it at three meters. Right. So you can stand here. Four year old. Four-year-old, <laughs> So now, when you have a four-year-old, you cannot do this. 
please go outside and you'll see good light giving you those glasses which are very fancy and you can So you can actually go close, okay? Right. So you can close your eye and here again, suppose you're using your fingers, make sure you use the cup of the palm to occlude and not like this. Because that tenant, most of the time if you ask parents to occlude, parents will hold it loosely, they can still see from through the fingers. So make sure you always occlude to the cup. Now, when uh, you are reading, mostly the child may not be able to tell from the stuff. So we just point from here. What is it? Circle. And here he is talking as an adult, but typically some children they do show circle. Or this is what you are showing. After that, what? After that, so this way comes again. You can completely come down till what activity the child can come. Right? So this you can repeat it for the other eye as well. And sometimes if the child is not able to see it at 3 meters, then you come at 1.5. Then you come closer at 1.5 and record the same visual activity in this recording calculation. The recording calculation, for example, uh, this is. This is like 3 by 19 they have written here, right? It is uh, 6 by 36, 3 by uh, 19, equivalent to 6 by 36. So this is how you record. So this is a 10 meter chart. So if you are recording it, you can record it as 6 by 36, all right? And the same way, if you come closer, then you need to accordingly reduce the distance and then uh, write the visual amplitude. Now the next is your uh, now, this is a regular Lia symbol. You also have Lia symbols with the crowding bars which are present, which will take care of the crowding phenomena. So, you have charts with the counter interaction bars or the flannels that you have. And when that is there, you can also use it as a single symbol. So, you can use it as a single symbol, dotted by as well. Now, uh, let's, this is a random dot stereo or a studio options chart. So let's see what he looks in here. Now this is more so a local studio options, right? So you will get some a rough response by this printing. But this is more of a global studio And I believe when you are looking up in your technical studio always good if you can use a random plot wherein there is no clue as to what the figure is in the chart. Right? Yeah, the global studio options. Right. Yeah. This yeah. is also the, the glass. And whenever you're using your stereopsis, you do it over the best correction always, yeah. right? And you hold the chart straight, you don't tilt it, you hold it straight, make sure there is enough make sure there is enough lighting that falls on the chart, right? And So there is guess of the picture, circle, triangle or this, you know, so. So when you are reading it, the other side is in front of you. You are simultaneously knowing the equities and you can record. So the test report is just behind. Now we look for the Basically, in this, what happens is the kid will say that one of the circles is seen 
in 3D. So it is floating in air, it is coming out, right? So whichever that option is based on this, what is given here, you can understand what is the response given. So if there is 400 seconds of arc, if they give this completely right, which means it is 12.5 seconds of arc. This is generally done at 40 centimeter. And if they say it is over here, which is they have read the ninth one correctly, it means it is 25 seconds of arc. And these are the DRPs ratings. So this is uh, used for very small kids. Now how do you record, if they can't even talk about those square circles or apples and whatever, these are Leah paddles. These are, can we use for Acha, can I, can I, can we just show both of them together? Yeah. So when you both show them, you can see which one you can see. Immediately you can see which one. Grating, right? You'll see the pattern. So the child will tell you how to see the pattern. The pattern will tell you how to see the pattern. Right? Want to try it? You want to see your vision? Tell us. 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 तो वो बच्चा अपनी आँख अगर उसकी विजन है उसको पैटर्न दिख रहा है तो I will move towards that direction अगर वो बिल्कुल ऐसे हो कि गर्दन घुमाने लग जाए छोड़ो क्या हो गया बोर हो गया that means उसको अब नहीं दिख रहा yeah, so can we just have... Similar principle is your hari hari low contrast as well. This may have to see it as well. So this is a high contrast and then thereby you have a reduced contrast now. So is it very good? Yes, come here with me to my bus. So the distance I agree is 3. This is 1 meter for the kid and then Again, the cow put the big hado kya dik ta kya hai. See, I hold it like this, right? And then do it like this. They go other usko dono plane dik rain, but the wosko face nay dik rain to concentration loose kar zay. You initially start with the high contrast and then you go down to the lower contrast. Wo contrast measure kar login and jetna dik ta jar hai, he's balancing it. Now tell me if I do it for all of you, how many of you are able to see anything? Yeah. Yes. What principle is this? What principle is this? What principle are we using? I think we want this to be explained very important. So, we are doing vision therapy, vision therapy, software. But this is the vision therapy. You can also take it in your home. Sabko chahiye. We all need it. So you become the patient. Ma'am is going to teach you how to do this therapy. See, basically, this is, everyone knows this is drop screen. Yeah. You just, you can do it with just two, or maximum three. You don't need so many pieces. Two fold and then you can do it with just two. And this end of it is tied to some pieces. I hold it. So that I hold it. So, yeah, 
दरवाजे के डोर में आई लेवल पे वन हैज टू टाइड ओके सो लेट्स से इट्स टाइड अप हियर राइट एंड द अदर एंड इज व्हाट पेशेंट इज गोइंग टू बी राइट सो ये बांधा हुआ है किसी के साथ आपने राइट सो यू वांट ही टी ही टू बेटे दूसरा हाथ छोड़ दे सीधा रख रस्सी को हाँ तो ग्रीन बीट सिंगल है उसको पीछे पर्पल बीट डबल दिख रहा है वो एक कोना बांध देते हैं और दूसरे कोने से पेशेंट को दिखाते हैं जिसकी तरफ देखना है वो सिंगल है दूसरा डबल है सो दिस इज होम बेस्ड थेरेपी एंड देयर वेरियस वेरियस अदर टेक्निक्स इन डूइंग इट बट सिंपल स्ट्रेन इज गोइंग टू गिव 1 मिनट एक्सरसाइज पर डे एंड इट्स अ जिम आई थिंक यू कैन रन द फ्लिपर्स बिकॉज़ वी हर्ड अ लॉट ऑफ फ्लिपर्स देयर इज एक्चुअली अ प्रॉपर रीडिंग कार्ड विद दिस अनफॉर्चूनेटली वो अभी नहीं फैसिलिटी कार्ड है हार्ट कार्ड से नहीं ऐसे कर ओके सो इसका चार्ट आता है वैसे टेस्ट करने के लिए जिसमें वो एल्फा वो लिखे होते हैं अवॉर्ड्स वगैरह No, he'll let him do. Better to cut. So we have to explain this. And so one will have to be. You have to do for one minute and count. Who can? No facility has to be so many cycles per minute. So in one minute, how many times did he flip? Can you face the audience and do this test for yourself? He'll hold it at forty. इसको पकड़ा हाँ and आप समझिए बेटे कैसे करना है like so you are going to be dummy to show how to do it yes plus ये वैसे पेशेंट के हाथ में होता है उसको पहले समझाने के बाद अब वो एक मिनट टाइमर लगा के वो जब क्लियर हो जाए फ्लिप कर दो क्लियर हो जाए फ्लिप कर दो 
और वो कितने साइकिल करे अब साइकिल क्या है दोनों साइड से कैसे होगा उसको माइनस से टाइम लग रहा है डिफिकल्टी क्लियरिंग माइनस ये ऐसे लिखा जा रहा है प्लस फटाफट कर लेता है क्या होगा डायग्नोसिस माइनस का मतलब क्या हो रहा है एकोमोडेशन को क्या करते हो जब माइनस लगाते हो तो वो क्या हो रहा है स्लो हो रही है ना ही इज हैविंग डिफिकल्टी इन डूइंग दैट और इसमें ट्रांसपेरेंट होता है और एक ओपेक होता है राइट जो ट्रांसपेरेंट है इट इज गोइंग टू इम्प्रूव दाइवर्जेंस एक्सरसाइज इसके लिए क्या दिया रेड ग्रीन ग्लासेस बेटे तुम फेस कर ले उधर ऑडियंस की तरफ इफ यूर ऑन माइंड what we ask them to do is we are give them a pen or a pointer typically with these cards you get a pointer right you keep the pointer at the same. now you remove the pen you still able to i it's 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 This is a binocular test. I made him occlude just to make you show that when when you put these glasses, when you occlude one eye, you will be able to see only one of them. Green se aapko bas red circles dikhenge. Red se aapko sirf green circles dikhenge, right? And when you keep a pencil and keep getting it closer, ye jo niche ke do circles hain, fused ho ke aapko center ek fused circle dikhega, which will be seen in 3D. All right? And you will also see these words clearly. And this is the lower sphere, just like the northern sphere. Can so these are more versions demand. So first you start with this, the smallest demand, and then you increase for higher demands. And once all these levels are reached, you can also shift from one and other. वो जब करोगे, you can train for facility as well. Do this, he fuses, then he shifts this greater demand fuses. Come back to this smaller demand fuses. So you with the same card, you can do CT training too. You can do amplitude training too. And typically, these are given for home therapy. You okay. can also have the emergence with the pencil yes. behind the card. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll try making it. Do you have a procedure? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
chart mein what is there is the same set of letters are there in this and the resume chart all right there are multiple ways in which you can search hai number 1 is if i am seeing the distance chart i'm starting to work is go 10 feet 3 meters lagana hai does that ye angles is like 40 centimeters that you hold to hold the same direction monocularly kar lo binocularly kar lo and do it binocularly no what you do is i'm looking at the first alphabet here i'm clearing it off as soon as i clear up i look at the distance chart wo first alphabet jo hai usko clear kar de this is one cycle then i again come to the next and then clear right ek baar udhar dekhna hai potty ek baar idhar wahan padhna hai yahan padhna hai wahan padhna hai and when you are telling to the patient ask them to read it out loud so that you are also able to right you can make them in lines you can make them vertical or horizontal
and this is brought to the eye level of the ball is placed at the eye level of the patient. Alright, and it is swung in a pendulum kind of a movement and the patient has to read the alphabets which are there on the ball. You want to check your seconds and pursuits ऐसे करके देखना आपने भी कितने अच्छे हैं। It also tests. This is office-based therapy. This is office-based therapy, right? Thank you so much. I think it's endless in your therapies and in things that you can do with eyes. Next time, patient ki aankhe thak gaye, kaam nahi ho raha, more kuch hai. Lot more to add into it. So I think we can end up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. This is your colleague Sri Vijay Kumar. Your fixation states to Mam Natari ki, right? And it's a very simple thing, tool, but it is very useful. एक आप यू कैन यूज़ इट एस अ फिक्सेशन और टारगेट व्हेन यू आर डूइंग योर पावर टेस्ट और व्हेन यू आर डूइंग एनी ऑफ योर टेस्ट या इवन बच्चे का फिक्सेशन अगर टेस्ट कर रहे हो देन यू कैन यूज़ दिस एस अ फिक्सेशन टारगेट एनीबडी हियर इज़ हैविंग एनी काइंड ऑफ़ फोरिया और एक्सोफोरिया
but luckily by God's grace and of course this person who is the person or the man behind this grand success of the event is none other than Mr. Rajan who has been our pillar of support and a very positive person. He has been very encouraging so please come forward and receive a small token of appreciation from us. I'll call them. And um, he's involved not only himself but his um, office employees as well who are here since yesterday helping us out with lot many things. Otherwise, an event of this magnitude is impossible but by just the two of us. So we need a whole team behind this. Somebody who's made me this way around today. 
and he only told me patient dekhte rehna aur sabko knowledge baantte rehna and that's his message which i want to convey thank you and i think i need to call my team to say thank you edu narendra and uh, anuj roshni chahat can you please be there डांट लगा के इन विचारों से भी बहुत काम कराया है सो थैंक यू सो मच यस थैंक यू वेरी मच मोर देन टीचर्स इन द वंडरफुल एमसी थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच इसका कभी डांस नहीं देखा YouTube पे कभी देख लेना YouTube बहुत अच्छे डांसेस कर दिए हैं शक्ति थैंक यू सो मच एंड आई थिंक द लास्ट वन इज संडे को अपने बिजनेस और प्रैक्टिस छोड़ छोड़ के आए हैं इट रियली मीन्स अ लॉट एंड आई थिंक वी ऑल केयर फॉर आर पेशेंट्स दैट इज द मेसेज एंड वंडरफुल इवेंट थैंक यू इट शुड बी अ लाइफ चेंजर कल को अगली बार एक आंख नहीं देखनी है दोनों आंख की कच्ची देखनी है थैंक यू सो मच मैम एंड नाउ वी क्लोज द डे एंड थैंक यू फॉर ऑल आर स्पॉन्सर्स चाय पी के जाना बहुत हेवी डोज हो गया थक गए हो गए and photo shoots and network around everybody cheers to all i can say yeah oh hi i'm interested to hear the in a punjabi style have pakoda <laughs> have tea with a dhokla it's all been waiting outside thank you have pakoda dekhte ho to